Our scripture today, friends, comes to us from the fifth chapter of Matthew's Gospel. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up to the mountains, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him. Then he began to speak and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Beloved of God, grace to you and peace from the one who created us, redeemed us, and moves among us still. Amen. What we just heard at church, these beautiful words from Matthew's gospel that are sometimes called the Beatitudes, are Jesus' very first sermon in this gospel. He's in the early days of his public ministry here in Matthew 5. His cousin John has baptized him in the Jordan River as we baptized Theo at this font at 9 o'clock this morning. Jesus has emerged from his 40-day wilderness journey, and he's called his first disciples And we hear at the end of Matthew chapter 4 that he's done a little bit of traveling and teaching and healing in the region of Galilee. But chapter 5 is where we really begin to learn what Jesus is all about. He's essentially introducing himself here to the crowds and to the disciples and also to us in this very first sermon of his. And here's what I want you to notice about Jesus' first sermon. I want you to notice how his sermon does not begin. Jesus doesn't begin with a whole bunch of thou shalls and thou shalt nots. He doesn't begin with a list of rules to follow in order to live a good and moral life. He doesn't begin with words of judgment. He doesn't begin by hollering about how we are all wretched sinners and generally terrible humans. He doesn't begin with a guilt trip. He doesn't begin by heaping words of shame on people's heads and hearts. No, the very first word of Jesus' very first sermon in the Gospel of Matthew is this. Blessed. Blessed. The first word out of Jesus' mouth is a blessing. And then he says it again and again and again and again as though he intuits what all of us here already know when we dare to touch those most hidden, tender, scared corners of our own souls, that we can't hear it enough. Blessed. Blessed are they. Blessed are you. Blessed are we, children of God. A little over 11 years ago, my then pastor, the incomparable Eric Christensen, walked into my hospital room at Rush University Medical Center to meet the brand new fresh baby in my arms. He carried with him what has since become one of my favorite books. It's called To Bless the Space Between Us. It's written by the late Irish poet and priest John O'Donohue, and he writes so beautifully about blessing and about why it's so important in a time like ours, which is so desperate for meaning and belonging. And so I want to share some of his words with you this morning. John O'Donohue writes, It would be infinitely lonely to live in a world without blessing. The word blessing evokes a sense of warmth and protection. It suggests that no life is alone or unreachable. Each life is clothed in raiment of spirit that secretly links it to everything else. Though suffering and chaos befall us, They can never quench that inner light of providence. And then he continues, a blessing evokes a privileged 
intimacy. It touches that tender membrane where the human heart cries out to its divine ground. A blessing is not a sentiment or a question. It is a gracious invocation where the human heart pleads with the divine heart. I believe each of us can bless, says O'Donohue. When a blessing is invoked, it changes the atmosphere. Some of the plenitude flows into our hearts from the invisible neighborhood of loving kindness, which is a phrase I love, the invisible neighborhood of loving kindness. In the light and reverence of blessing, a person or a situation becomes illuminated in a whole new way. Isn't that beautiful? Blessing is warmth. Blessing is protection. Blessing is connection. Blessing is intimacy. Blessing is that tender space where the human heart pleads with the divine heart and the two come together. And blessing illuminates people and situations in completely new ways. Or put in other words, blessing begins a transformation. Now, if we're able to tune our spirits to hear them, we might notice two transformations that are unfolding in these blessings of Jesus. First is a transformation in how we perceive where God is at work in the world. A transformation in how we perceive where God is at work in the world. Church, our culture tells us that we are hashtag blessed. If we have money and influence and all the happiness that we think we deserve, But these blessings of Jesus, this space where the human heart and the divine heart come together, reveal an entirely different kind of God, one who shows up in moments of vulnerability, one who comes alongside those practicing mercy and peacemaking, one who is revealed in the lives of the poor and the meek, one who is present in our grief which some of us carry so poignantly into this All Saints Sunday. I don't know if Jesus was the kind of preacher who talked with his hands, but I can imagine his hands held gently like this as though he is tenderly holding on to each one of our beloved hearts as words of blessing settle around them. And the second transformation that I think Jesus points to in this text is a transformation of our own lives transformation of our own lives. Dr. Marty Stortz, in her book about the Beatitudes as a compass for discipleship, suggests that Jesus isn't just introducing himself to the disciples in this first sermon. He's also introducing the disciples to themselves, telling them who they might become if they follow him. As the warmth of blessing settles around the disciples, And as they begin to pattern their own lives after Jesus, the disciples will discover an incredible and astonishing capacity for embodying the very blessings that Jesus offers to them in this sermon. As I said, we're at the beginning of Matthew's gospel today, but by the end of the story, the disciples will be feeding the hungry, tending to the sick and brokenhearted, giving drink to the thirsty and clothing the naked, The disciples' lives are transformed because they have been transformed in their ability to perceive God's presence in vulnerability. And that invitation comes to us as well, each and every day. In fact, it came to our family in a surprising way just yesterday. 42 Venezuelan refugees moved into the Lutheran church across the street from our house in Oak Park just a couple of days ago. And the pastor of that church is a friend of ours, and so I texted him yesterday afternoon, and he got us connected to the team of community organizers who are coordinating Oak Park's response to this refugee crisis that is now literally in my backyard. My name and my cell phone number is now on the whiteboard uh, at the church as the 24-hour on-call Spanish-English translator And I worked with a couple of the organizers yesterday to pull together a network of families who live within walking distance of the church so that these families can have a place to shower and to do laundry. So our family last night welcomed another family of five into our home, including um, their kiddos, 13-year-old Carlos and 11-year-old Giovanni, 
and four-year-old Mariana so that they could bathe um, together with their parents for the first time in more than a week. And someone I love said to us last night, wow, you were really the face of Jesus for that family. I don't know, friends, offering a shower doesn't seem like such a big deal, actually, in light of what all of these friends have endured in their lives to this point. And I, of course, hope that they experienced a moment of God's grace in our home. But if we are to believe Jesus' words in this Sermon on the Mount, and I do believe them, then what I can say for sure is that the presence of God entered our home last night, along with those refugees. Blessed are the poor, the meek, the persecuted, the reviled. The kingdom of God belongs to such as these. And God's reign came near to us through their presence, just as God's reign comes near to you when your heart is opened to the suffering of others or when you patiently engage with a child who is up on your last thread of patience or when you spend just a moment in conversation with an elderly neighbor who is particularly lonely in the light of God's character and under the blanket of Christ's blessing, no gesture of care is too small. Nothing done in love is ever lost or attempted in vain. Friends, if you've been here over these last weeks, you know that we are in the midst of a fall generosity appeal here at Grace. We are prayerfully seeking $169,000 in new giving in 2024, which is a sum that almost sounds offensive coming out of my mouth, given what our family experienced with our new neighbors last night. That new giving will allow us to sustain our current ministries, to invest more deeply in our young people, and to enter into spaces of mutual blessing with our sister congregation, Mission Unidad in Berwyn. $169,000 is a big number, friends, but as we stand here today, literally in the midst of these beloved saints of God who have gone before us and in the midst of our beloved saints of God who are around us right now, people in need who are awaiting the love of Jesus just like our hearts are awaiting the love of Jesus through encounters with them. I am absolutely confident that this congregation, when we come together as a whole, has the capacity to offer at least that much to the ministries that God is unfolding here among us. If you're a member of this community, you'll be receiving a letter in the mail this week together with some other materials about this Bound Together generosity appeal. And that mailing will invite you to consider growing your giving in 2024. That mailing will also invite you to complete an intent card, either online or in paper form, which We'll share during our offering moment next Sunday, November 12th, as a sign of our commitment to generous living. If you are a new giver, that letter will invite you to consider a practice of offering just a dollar a day to God's work through this congregation. Those gifts of $7 a week coming together with those who sustain or grow in giving across all of the different levels that you see in the bulletin insert that you picked up on your way into worship together. Well, friends, all of that is enough. There is enough. There is more than enough. And so today, may our hearts and our hands and our lives be opened to receive the transformative blessing of Jesus, however and in whomever it comes to you today. And in that transformation, May we come to know again our power as God's people to bless, to heal, and to renew one another in the light of God's love. Amen.